My next patient is um, Mai, and she's a female about 14 years old. And she's got a very constricted arch and a two size discrepancy. So we're going to, we're talking at this time, in this session about the bolt analysis. So we're going to cover that in this presentation. But right now we're going to talk about uh, this 14 year old girl. Now remember, most girls will grow to 14 or 15. So she still could have some growth potential left. But you can see with her smile, it's very narrow here. Got a very narrow constricted arch, very narrow smile, and we want to fix that. She's also got two lingually displaced lateral incisors. And she's got two deciduous lateral incisors in position, but the permanent lateral incisors are lingually displaced. And we've talked about this many times, but the reason that the lateral incisors come in lingually displaced is because you've got a narrow constricted upper arch. So that all could have been avoided if she'd had an expansion appliance when she was six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, whenever. All she would, or actually earlier, before the laterals erupted. So, so the earlier the better. Probably the expansion appliance should come in at six or seven. And then there would have been room for the lateral incisors, and then hopefully they wouldn't have erupted on the lingual. So again, that's why the, the treatment of children at an early age, diagnosis and treatment is so important. Her profile looks very straight. In fact, it looks almost prognathic. It looks like she could be a, a slight class three. She's either a class three or a class one. And again, I don't have the CEPH in the presentation, but I have the CEPH and all the records for all the cases, but I just haven't shown you all the CEPHs and all the records for all the cases. But for sure, she looks like she could be a slight class three or, or a class one. Let's look at the, at the occlusion. Well, if you look carefully, you can see she's almost end to end. And over in this photo, on the left, it looks like the lower incisors are lingually torqued. So when you see the lower incisors lingually torqued, you've got to be suspicious of a class 3. Plus the cuspid is slightly class 3, plus the molar is definitely class 3. So you've got a class 3 molar, class 3 cuspid, lower incisors lingually inclined, that's a class 3. And you hope now that she's all through growing. But remember, she's 14, she could grow to 15, and sometimes class 3s even grow longer. So we have to be aware of that. We have to worry that, that the mandible might come forward on us. And, and that's definitely a concern. The other thing that we look at is we can see, remember I told you, there's the lateral incisor that's lingually displaced. There's the deciduous lateral. There's the two bicuspids in crossbite. And if you look here at the frontal photo, you can see that both sides look like they're going in. It looks like a very constricted upper arch. We like to see a nice broad arch. We don't like to see a constricted arch. Again, this case should have been treated earlier. So, we look at, we look at that situation, and, and the other thing you have to remember is when you expand an arch, you sometimes open the bite. Now, she's end to end here. She's got like a one millimeter overjet and one millimeter overbite. So when you expand an arch, you have to worry about the bite opening in the front. When you expand an arch, on a class three and you free up the mandible and the patient still has some growth potential left, then the mandible could come forward. So she could come forward into a class three. So this looks like a relatively easy case, but you have to be aware that this could, this could be a more difficult case. If the bite opens and if, if the mandible comes forward, then it's not an easy case. So, so class three potential cases are not easy cases. And you can see she has some other interesting things happening here. Again, you can see the lateral incisors on the palate. You can see the deciduous laterals in place. And you can see a very constricted arch, particularly in the area of the bicuspids. And you can also see that, that the, the, the upper first bicuspids are much larger than the upper second bicuspids. There's quite a two size discrepancy here. So look at the size of the upper first bicuspid and then the upper second bicuspid and look at the lower bicuspids. The lower bicuspids both look normal size. So again, you'd have to worry that if you had a two size discrepancy, are you going to get a proper occlusion at the end? Are the, are the occlusion in the area of the bicuspids and the cuspids going to be normal when you've got such a large upper first bicuspid, such a small second bicuspid and, the, and normal size lower bicuspids? I think you should mention that to the patient that, you know, you have some different shaped teeth, 
that might make it difficult to get a final perfect finish. We're still going to have your teeth straight, they're still going to have a nice smile, but maybe the, the, the bite won't be absolutely perfect, but it'll still, still be able to chew your food, you'll still be fine, but we may not be able to get a textbook finish because we don't have the proper size teeth to start with. But don't worry, we'll do the best we can. So with that, now the lower arch, always in class threes you've got a broad arch. And you can see that's a nice broad arch. The other interesting thing is, look at how these teeth are rolled lingually. Look at how the, the second bicuspid and the molars are torqued lingually like this. So you know that when we put our straight wire brackets on, remember the torque on our, on our bicuspids and molars are minus 12. So the torque on our molars is minus 12. So we put, when we put our arch wire into the slot, the tooth is going to go to minus 12. Well, if the tooth starts out at minus 35, like this, tooth starts out at minus 35, and you can see those teeth are really lingually inclined, and then you put an arch wire in there, you're going to upright that tooth to minus 12. So we're going to get a lot of uprighting on the lower arch with our brackets, pre-programmed brackets to upright to minus 12. So we're definitely going to have to expand that upper arch. We're already in crossbite, but when the lower is upright, we're going to have to expand the upper or the oral will be in buccal crossbite. So you have to consider that and look carefully at your arches. And both sides, you can see the molars and the bicuspids are definitely lingually inclined. And the incisor look very upright or maybe slightly lingually inclined. So that's very common in class threes. So that's the case. Again, very large upper first bicuspids, very small second bicuspids, two size discrepancy. You need to do the Bolton analysis on your cases prior to treatment to see if you do have a two size discrepancy. If you do, you need to mention that to the patients ahead of time so their expectations for a so-called so perfect finish are not there. So my treatment plan was to use a banded Hyrex on the upper. I, I like the banded Hyrex. It's one of my favorite appliances. You can make it with a memory screw where you turn the screw, or you can make it with a regular screw where the patient turns the screw twice a week. And it consists of a band on the first molars and mesial rests on the first bicuspids and a, and a Hyrex screw. It's a very simple appliance, and it's a very effective appliance. So there we have it. We have the, the midline screw, and you can see the arrows. And we have keys now that have a light and those keys with a light on it are excellent. And uh, you need to talk to the labs. And because the parents, when they're trying to adjust that, or, the, or she's trying to adjust it, she can't see back there. So when you have a light, you can, you can shine the light on. You can see where that, um, I, I'm pointing right now to the, um, to the opening in the screw. And you'll put your key in that. And, and the arrows are going back. And then you'll turn it back all the way. So you put the key in the anterior part and turn it back and then take it out. And the key's on a swivel. So get the key with the, with the light. They're not that expensive, and the lab will include that with the appliance. And that'll make it easier for the patient to adjust that appliance. And they need to adjust it twice a week. I tell them every Wednesday, every Saturday. Every Wednesday, every Saturday. And then they'll remember. So we're going to cement our bands. And then we're going to put flowable composite on the mesial rests. And remember, I've told you this before, I like to fit my own bands. So I'll bring the patient in one week before. I'll put the separators, mesial and distal, to the first molars on both sides. Bring the patient back in a week, take the separators out, fit the two bands, take the bands off the teeth, put them on a cotton roll, slide the bands on a cotton roll, wrap them up carefully so they won't get distorted, take an upper impression of the, of the molars separated, pour it in yellow stone, and send the upper model and the two bands to the lab and they'll send you back the Hyrex and you know it's going to fit because you fit the bands. If you ask the lab to fit the bands and they scrape the model, sometimes the Hyrex won't fit. The bands won't fit the, with, with the patient and that's not good. So recommend that you fit the bands. Plus you're going to have your tubes on the buckle. So as soon as we expand, we can immediately go into straight wire and we've got our brackets on the, on the, on the teeth. We want our brackets on the, on the teeth with, with the proper tip and torque. So there it is, but don't forget to, to, to bond with flowable composite the mesial rests. Otherwise, you've just got two teeth 
holding, whereas you want retention of four teeth. The reason you have the rest is because this bar right here, if you don't put the rest in the mesial, besides giving you better retention, that bar could dig in right here on the palate and cause a discomfort for the patient. So we always use mesial rests. So here's the patient. Now we've expanded the Hyrex four millimeters. We, I usually like to do the expansion first before I put the straight wire on. Because I find when there's more room in the arch, then the, the, um, the brackets go on better and the teeth aren't so sore. When there's room for the teeth, they don't hurt nearly as much when you straighten them. So we've expanded um, four millimeters, but I want you to see what's happening with our expansion. Remember I told you, when you expand a case, you have to think sometimes the bite will open. Well, you can see our, our patient now has got about a half a millimeter open bite here on the right side. And you can see that the cuspid now has gone into class three and the molar's class three. So what's happening is the bite's opening and the mandible is slowly coming forward a little more class three. So that makes the case a lot more difficult. So we're losing our class one cuspid, we're losing our class one molar relationship on this side, and we're opening the bite a little bit in the front and we're just getting started. We've only opened the hyrex screw four millimeters and we need more expansion. Now we've opened six millimeters. But look what's happening on the, on the left side. We started out with a slight class three cuspid relationship and now it's about two or three millimeters class three. And the molar is worse now. It's much more class three than when we started. So for sure, the mandible, because you're expanding the maxilla, the mandible is coming forward a little bit. Possibly the mandible is trapped and the condyle wants to move a little bit down and forward to a more comfortable position. And one key would be if you did a TMJ evaluation on the patient and found some signs and symptoms of TMD, you, would, you need to expect it to happen. So a patient with temporomandibular joint dysfunction and you expand the upper arch, the mandible will definitely come down and forward, trying to get the condyle in a more comfortable position in the glenoid fossa, away from the nerves and blood vessels. The patient almost decompresses their own joint if you allow the mandible to have room to move to a different position. So you can see this case now is, is, is shaping up to be a much more difficult case than we start, thought in the beginning because we've got a class three cuspid, class three molar. Now we're almost end to end. In fact, almost into an anterior crossbite here. We're end to end. So any more movement, we could go into crossbite. The, um, we extracted one, the primary lateral on the, uh, on, the, on the left side. And you can see the permanent laterals there. And we've expanded about six millimeters now, so maybe we're almost in a position. You can see here on the, on the, on the right side, sorry, on the left side, we've extracted that primary um, lateral. Now we're going to try and straighten that one lateral incisor. A lot of my patients like the clear brackets. When I have a two typodonts. I actually have three typodonts. I've got one typodont with the diamond brackets and the colored ligature ties, which I show the children. I've got another type of aunt with the clear brackets. And the clear brackets that I like now are called the neolucent clear brackets. I get those from ortho organizers in the United States, and I get them from Serum Ortho in Canada. And they're excellent. They're translucent brackets, and they're really nice because you, the, the, the true color of the tooth comes right through. You, can't, you can hardly see the brackets. This was a technique that we tried for a while when we put these crosses on here. But the trouble with those crosses because they only came in one color. And, and if you had different color teeth, sometimes they looked good, sometimes they didn't. What we're trying to do is get away from the ligature ties that stain. That's the big disadvantage of the clear bracket is the ligature tie stain. But we've got uh, smoky and pearl, two ligature ties by ortho organizers that don't stain as much, okay? So it's called pearl and smoky. So those are the ones we use now. But we use these crosses for a while, but we don't use those anymore. We found that they weren't, they weren't very effective. So you can see, but this case had the crosses, and we just put, we put the brackets on cuspid to cuspid. The, the clear brackets are more bulky than the metal brackets, but they look a lot better, and a lot of patients want them. But if you can get away with just going from cuspid to cuspid with the clear brackets, try that, because then the metal brackets are, are less bulky on the bicuspids, and, and a little easier in the patient's cheek. They don't, they don't protrude as much. So we've just tied that in now with an 014 night tie wire. That's our number one leveling wire. We start most of our cases with that. It's only 60 grams of force. 
You can bend it 87 degrees, you won't distort it. It's an excellent wire, very light, gentle, continuous forces. It's nickel titanium, we call it nitai. And, and now we've tied everything in. So it goes right back to the molar. Remember the molar has got a, um, a Hyrex. Now it looks like we've overexpanded the upper. But remember, the lower teeth haven't, haven't been bracketed yet and they're gonna upright with the torque that's built into my brackets, the minus 12 torque that's built in the cuspids, uh, the, sorry, the bicuspids and the molars. So those teeth are gonna upright on their own with just the wires. So we have to overexpand anticipating that. So you can see, we've tied everything in. Here it is now, this is the occlusal view. You've opened six millimeters, the high is open six millimeters. And you can see that the 014 nickel titanium tire is tied in. And you can see that for sure, the, the clear brackets are definitely bulkier than the metal brackets. There's the metal bracket on the bicuspid. There's the clear bracket on the, on the lateral. But patients don't care usually. They, they don't care, they want the appearance. They don't want their brackets to show. And, and, and I think clear brackets are vastly underrated. I mean, most patients don't even know about clear brackets. So you really should have some brochures in your office, in your waiting room, showing patients about clear brackets so they know about the clear brackets. Everybody knows about Invisalign. Everybody knows about metal brackets. They don't know about clear brackets. And there's a lot of patients in my practice that wouldn't have braces unless I offer them the clear. So I always show them the clear brackets, and, and a lot of them want that. If they want faster treatment, of course, we go the self-legating brackets. If they want, they want the fastest treatment, they go self-legating with no colored ligature ties. And if they want a little slower treatment, but they want nice aesthetic result, then they go with the clear. So again, we haven't, we haven't activated the, uh, there's no room for this lateral on the lingual on the, on the right. But the, over here, you can see there is room for the, for the lateral on the left. So if there's room for the lateral on the left, we tie in the left lateral. But the right lateral, we're going to leave for a while. And then we're going to have to put an open coil in there to make space for that tooth. So again, this tooth was lingually displaced here. And you can see now it's tied in. And it's, uh, it's, it's looking good. OK, so it probably took about two months after tying that tooth in, three at the most, to get that tooth into position. Now the Hyrex is open 10 millimeters. We want lots of expansion, because remember those lower teeth are going upright, we want a nice broad smile. And now we've got an open coil over here to make room for the right lateral incisor. So the left lateral incisor is aligned. Now we're going to put an open coil in here to try and make room for the right lateral incisor. We don't want to tie it in until there's room. So there we have it. Now the patient now has to be in a working wire. Remember, we lined up the left lateral with a, with a leveling wire, the 014 nitai. Now that the tooth's lined up, and you can see it, there's the tooth nicely lined up, the left lateral is in position. Now what we want to do, we want to make room for the right lateral. So we put a piece of open coil on, and remember we measure from the mesial of the cuspid, the bracket on the cuspid, to the distal of the bracket on the, on the, on the central, and say that's, say that's 10 millimeters. So you go 10 plus 4, it's 14 millimeters. Cut a piece of open coal off 14 millimeters, slide it on the arch wire, and then compress it, tie it in, and then it tries to do that. When you compress a coil of 14, and the space is only 10, as soon as you take off the, as soon as you tie in the brackets, it wants to do this. And so that'll slowly make space. Don't use more than 4, or you might cause a rotation of the teeth on the end and you're trying to prevent rotation, not cause rotations. So we're just going to change that every month. The patient comes in, measure the space, add four millimeters, cut a new piece of open coil off, put it in there. It might take three months to make the space. And we must be in a working wire. We've got two working wires. You've got the 018 CNA, which is 280 grams, or you've got the 1925 V43, which is 100, 200, and 300 grams. V force means variable force. Three force levels in the one wire. But now we've got the 018 CNA in the upper, and on the bottom we're just starting to line the teeth up, so we've got the 018 nitai on the bottom. Now, if the, if the teeth are pretty straight, which the lower ones were, we can start with an 018 nitai. If the teeth were crooked, 
or if the patient was really very sensitive teeth, I would start with an 014 night tie. But when the teeth are pretty straight, we start with an 018 night tie, which is about 80 grams of force, which is, which is very light, gentle forces. The other thing you have to worry about is when you put the brackets on a class three case, and there's, if there's any crowding at all, the lower incisors will flare. And you'll cause more of an anterior crossbite, which you don't want. So you can see my bite is opening. My bite is opening more. I've got a, a one millimeter anterior open bite over here. I've got my cuspid, still class three. I've got my molar class three. I've got my separators in down here to put a molar band on that lower molar. But my case is getting more difficult, isn't it? I mean, it, we're, we're developing an anterior open bite where, where, where the mandible is coming forward. I've got class three cuspid, class three molar. This is a more difficult case to treat.